How are we doing here? This Hope for it, it says great. it says good morning behind us. Good morning. But we're welcoming people to the 12 p.m. service, it's which afternoon. means it's afternoon. Yeah. We, we should probably get our intelligent graphic design <laughs> department to get right on that. It's but just changing a, a word. Morning good, to afternoon. Good afternoon. afternoon. Good afternoon to every single one of you joining us today Hello. online. We're so glad that you're with us today. Yeah. We've got an incredible Sunday oh coming gosh. up here in church this morning. This afternoon. This afternoon. This afternoon. I feel I feel confused. I feel lost. I'm in another time zone apparently or something. Maybe maybe somebody's joining us from California. Ooh. Uh, okay. Then it, then I'd it's like good morning. to bet five hundred dollars someone's joining us from California. That's a really poor bet to be making this morning. <laughs> but right, type but it in hey, the chat if you're here from Cali. If you're joining us from California and I bet against you, I'm I'm really <laughs> sorry. But but hey, what what's going on today? Well, we've got people all throughout the lobby coming out of our first service. Yes, so we have a lot going on here. Um, and a major thing is we have a bake sale even for youth. Yo, so if anybody in the room can hear us, bake sale happening yes. for Cool to Be Kind campaigns coming up in the next couple of weeks as well. So keep your eyes tuned online for Absolutely. that coming up in the next little bit. Yes. But as people in the room start getting seated, maybe you're at home eating lunch. Um, classic lunch for a Sunday afternoon, craft Ooh. dinner. Craft dinner all the time. Craft what's, dinner. what's your go-to Sunday afternoon My meal? My go-to Sunday afternoon dinner, afternoon lunch? After lunch? Dinner? Lunch? lunch meal? Lunch? Meal? meal? Snack? Meal? Pasta, pasta, solid pasta and ground beef. Oh, so like, you can't you can't go wrong with that. Are, are we talking kind of like balance. hamburger helper style or like good seasonings? Good, good seasonings. You know, you you need to add the pizzing to it to make it you know a proper Sunday afternoon, afternoon extravaganza. Yeah. What is what is the perfect uh, mixture of ingredients to make a pizzing, a as, pizzing. as they say? Okay, uh, you need. Oregano, check in your kitchen. Or is that oregano or oregano? Oregano. Oregano? Is it number one or number two? Wow. Oregano or oregano? Let us oregano. know in the chat. Oregano. Let us know in the chat oregano. what it is. Is it oregano or oregano? 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 Hmm. Tomato, tomato, oregano. Uh, tomato, yes, oregano. tomato. Oregano. Okay. Does 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 tomato go with oregano or oregano? Ooh, it's. Tomato yes. and oregano. <laughs> so you're mixing it all up. <laughs> this is ridiculous. I don't know why we're talking about this. And all you need I paprika as well. Paprika. Yes. Paprika and oregano. That's all it paprika, takes to bring pazing. Oregano and tomato. Tomato. Yeah. Tomato. tomato. And it's tomato, not tomato. In <laughs> case anybody really, really cares. But yes. hey, we got just a few minutes coming up before church. I think we're gonna probably start service a touch late yeah. today because there's just so much bustling and stuff happening here in church. But bustle and bustle. but we we thought it would be a really good idea uh, to bring up some guests. So if my minions yes. are, are watching, I don't have any minions. In case I'm minions. not I'm not Groot or <laughs> what's his name? Gru. Gru. Yeah. Is, Groot or Gru. Groot? Groot is the good guy from Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, Gru is the evil guy from Despicable Me. I think it's Groot. Groot. Yes. Well, I'm not Gru, so I don't have minions. <laughs> but if if anybody is listening and wants to gather mm. some 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 willing Ooh. participants, Ooh, I see a willing yes. participant. We, we got Isabella coming to join us. Uh, Isabella, come join us up she, here. She she waved and she, she was like, waved. Hey. She's like, like yes, I come. I want to be embarrassed in front of the camera here, today. Here you go. So, you can take your you mask off <laughs> to, but. Uh, but we're here. This is Isabella, if, in case you're wondering. We are... Isabella, wave, wave to the, to the online camera. crew. Hi. <laughs> Hi. That's, that's, <laughs> that's what she's going for today. Hi. I think we also need one more guest. So if anybody... Mm. If Caitlin McDonald can find one person to come join us up on the stage, mm. I'll take them. Oh, anybody. Do anybody have? to come join us and talk do, about do have? Christmas. Oh, to, oh, yes. oh, we got another. We got another. All right, here we go. Come up. Just oh, hop up. Yeah. Hop on up here. This is great. So we decided today that we are going to talk about a this or that kind of scenario, yeah. all right? Okay. Yeah. So it is, what's the date today? Uh, as I stare at my dead phone. <laughs> what is the date today? The date is the, date is the, the 28th. 28th, I believe. Yes. 28th. Which means that there is three days less than a month until Christmas, which means yeah. if I'm doing Crazy. math correctly, that's 27 days. We have 27 days till Christmas, which means that... Uh, we need to know some things about Christmas. Your yeah. Christmas decor. Have you started your Christmas tree yet? Um, my mom did just put it up. Yeah. Oh, like, uh, so you have the Christmas vibe yeah. going on. So like, yeah, we got little trinkets. Trinkets. Little I trinkets? See. Just trinkets. Christmas trinkets? <laughs> okay. What about yourself? Have you, have you gotten a Christmas tree yet? 
Uh, so I live in residence and I'm an international student. So yeah. my family is going to meet up in London this December. Oh, yeah, <laughs> so we'll like do that. In yeah. <laughs> so wow. That's so yeah, that's what we're doing. Okay, so no Christmas decorations in res because it's a somber, sad place. It's if you're joining us online res. from the residence of Carlson or University of Ottawa or whatever other residence you might be joining us from, maybe you're at the University of Toronto. Guelph. Saint Guelph? Saint Guelph. Guelph was. What was that one? St. Paul? Does St. Paul have residence though? Oh, I don't, I don't know. It's in Ottawa, yeah. St. Paul University. Yeah, so yeah. We've, got, we've got residences. Maybe you're joining us from a residence, but. Uh, but if your university is properly educated, they should have properly a Christmas. Properly educated. Uh, yes, educational wow. institutions need to be educated about the proper time to put up a Christmas tree. That's all I got to say. Okay, but, that's his two cents. But here's the real question. Real tree or fake tree? Ooh, that's a good one. You, a real tree? I think real trees are the... Uh, my, my personal opinion, I'm having this debate with my wife right now. Real tree or fake tree? She's like, real tree is too expensive to buy every year. I mean, the, yeah. She's more of the... the dis I'm more of the disposable Christmas tree type. You know, uh, chop it down, make it die. Uh, all those kind of fun, joyous Christmas <laughs> occasions. <laughs> well, she's like, store it in a box. It's exactly. cheaper. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I'm also a fake tree guy. You're like, a fake tree guy? Your wife is right. My yeah. wife? Uh, I've been told. Uh, <laughs> go on. Last year was my... Um, first experience with the real tree um they're messy and they're hard to get rid of thank you it's really hard. hard to get it out of the house once you get it in because when it, it's all wrapped up right but I there's there's down, something so special about going to a random parking lot in barhaven <laughs> a random <laughs> that corner lot. by a canadian tire you know that one you go there you get your pre-wrapped christmas sketchy. tree <laughs> yeah i was there yesterday Oh, I was so was tempted oh, to pick up a Christmas okay. tree. So was it, was there a guy in a trench coat and was like, "Yo, do you want a Christmas tree?" No, he was and in he plaid. Like pulled out no, no, he was in <laughs> he was in the trench coat of the Christmas season. I see. All plaid, top to bottom, plaid to and bottom, plaid. plaid, like plaid, plaid together plaid is the trench coat. It's that's, Canadian. That's right. Is yeah, it yeah, the Canadian yeah. tuxedo? No, that's denim on denim. But <laughs> okay. The yeah, the creepy yeah, exactly. the creepy parking lot Christmas tree sales guy. Okay. And it smells good. It makes your house smell good. That is really that is the one go to. Yeah, I've that I've never heard of. Last last year for Christmas, my wife and I would we literally would we grabbed a tiny Christmas tree, which was really somebody went into a forest and top just chopped the top off of a Christmas tree. So we just had a little you know a little shrub of a Christmas tree, but but yeah. So real or fake? I'm a real guy. Oh, we I'm got gonna some say, fake. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say fake. Fake? It's just more reasonable. Uh, realistic. Okay. Realistic. We're going for the realistic. You're a real tree? <laughs> no, fake. Fake all the way? Fake. Can I, I do have one question for you, okay. and I might get in trouble for this, but okay, are there ahead. real Christmas trees in Nigeria? No, not at all. <laughs> I didn't think like, so. Literally so this, this might indicate your, your opinion here. I mean, that is true. I mean, you go to people's houses, and they have, like, a white Christmas tree. Like White Christmas trees? <laughs> yes. I said that I've Oh my yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, they're not gonna get a Christmas tree in Nigeria. Okay, so a, in my house, we our our Christmas tree is probably still up from like 2019. 2019 Christmas tree in the never house. Never took it down, and it's really? a good yeah. Like it's just right there, and we just have a white Christmas tree chilling in our living room. <laughs> a white Christmas tree in Nigeria <laughs> living is, room that all is year round. For you. Maybe you're joining us from Nigeria next to your white Christmas tree. Well, we're glad you're joining us as well, but. Hey, okay. Yeah. I'm fake or real, so we've decided that today. Yeah. Question number two. Phil's already answered it for us, yeah. but uh, but really the question becomes, when is the appropriate time to get Christmassy? Mm. 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 December 24th. December 24th. Oh. So that's Christmas Eve, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, that's like that, the day before Christmas. That is the summary so that we uh, we needed, apparently. <laughs> exactly. If you're if you're sitting at home and December 24th is the time to get Christmassy, yeah. um, I'd like to just say you're wrong. You um, are late. This, this, is, this is the final address to the camera today on the pre-show. <laughs> you're wrong. Uh, you're you're wrong about wrong. Christmas if you decided 24th of, Christ of December is your time for Christmas. But, but hey, it is 12-18. It is we're, we started at just a little bit late because there's so much happening here in the life of church. But yep. if you're online with us, we would love for you to join us after service in our virtual lobby. Absolutely. Our virtual lobby is literally where you guys can come together and just experience the community of church. You might be distant online. You might be somewhere all around the province, all around the country. Maybe even you're an international student who's gone home and you're all the way across the world. Yeah, yeah. Literally. The best part of online church is that you can take church with you wherever you go. But 
But uh, if that's you, join us in the virtual lobby join afterwards. Us, We'd love to get to us, know you. We'd love to continue us. community here in the life of church. But we're going to get started in just a couple minutes. We're yeah. going to kick it off with a pre-roll loop in just a minute. You can grab a coffee, grab some craft dinner, I think we started or out. Or pasta. Or pasta, pasta with, with, with ground, ground beef oregano. Or Oregano. Oregano, as, as Philip says. Okay. Oregano. Oregano on your oregano. On your pasta. Oregano. 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 You needed another Come closing on, But anyways, <laughs> let's get started with church. This conversation is absolutely meaningless, but <laughs> we will see you guys soon. We can't wait to worship with you in just a couple minutes, and, and have a great Sunday. Yeah, have a great Sunday. Yeah. 
darkness may have a hold but come on light is more powerful than darkness amen Jesus overcame death and the grave amen come on let's sing about it come on let's invite him say open up open up the windows open up the windows let the light in open up the windows let the light in open up the windows let the light in. let the light in. Let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, yeah, come on. Let the light in, let the light in, let the light in. Open up the windows. Let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, open up the windows. Let the light in, let the light in, let the light in. Open up the windows. Let the light in. Oh, 
breathe the air of heaven where pain is gone and mercy fills the street to look upon the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity come on sing there will be so there will be a day when all bow before him and there will be a day where death will be no more standing face to face with he who died and rose again oh, songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear but in the end we'll see it all was worth it when he shall come to wipe away our tears oh there will be a day when all will bow before him oh there will be a day when death will be no more Standing face to face With He who died and rose again Holy, holy is the Lord Oh, we love you, Jesus And on that day We join the resurrection And stand beside the heroes of the faith and with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb that was slain come on one more time Amen. and on that day we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the
And if you're comfortable, why don't you just lift up your hands to Jesus and just in an honest way, just why don't you just begin to thank him. Thank you, Jesus. You've never left me. Even in moments where I felt alone, you were right there because the promise of your word says that you never leave. And so we hold on to that promise. Your promise stands outside of feelings, emotions, circumstances. Your promise, your promises are sure. You're sure about what you say. You don't take it back. You don't change your mind. Thank you, Jesus. You've never left us. I'm not abandoned. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Oh, you never left me, God. Come on, we're going to teach you a song. Never walked alone. I've never been abandoned. You are my inheritance. You are my strength and shield. And I have confidence. You go before me. You are my deliverer.
You know, I love what it says in Psalm 139. It's the Psalm of David. David's this guy in the Bible who has all of these roller coasters of emotions, this life situation that comes out of it every turn. But Psalm writes this in Psalm 139. He says, you've searched me, Lord, and you know me. What would it be like to even just rest in this for a moment, to make this your prayer? You've searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is even on my tongue, you know it completely. You hem me in and behind and before you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. I love this. It says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the night become light around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you. I love this part. It says, for you created my inmost being. Sit with that a second. God knows what you're going through. He created you. He knows what's going on inside you. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. I love this because even in this situation, we don't know what David was going through when he wrote this. But he was willing and able to stand in that situation and say, no, God, you know what I'm going through. You know where I am. No matter where I am, no matter how far it feels like I am from you, you know it all. And I wonder for us today, even even standing and singing this song about how God's gone before us, how God's with us in every single situation, what would it look like to even reflect on that for just a moment? You know, I said this this morning, but we're going into this season that for a lot of people can be go, 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 right? People in school, it's exams. For people with families, it's Christmas shopping. For, for literally, if you live on Maryville or just off of Maryville like me, there's go, go, go at every turn. Like, it takes three times as much just to get to church in the morning on a Sunday morning now. But, but literally, our life is so busy and bustly and go, go, go. But what would it look like to just stop and breathe? To breathe in the truth of this. To breathe in the truth of, God, you're with me. We were even talking about it in our junior high program this morning, about literally this whole season is about Emmanuel, God with us. Well, what if we kicked off the Christmas season, stepped into it with that idea of like, as we go through this, Jesus is with us every single step of the way. So I'd love to just stand in that revelation together this morning. I don't know what each and every one of you are going through, but I've got some, some prayer requests on a card here. There's more coming in the chat online as well. Um, there's somebody preparing for a surgery. There's people praying online for people, Christians all over the world who are falsely imprisoned for their faith. I've got some here too for a healing for a mom in hospital. We've got somebody who's looking for a job. We've got people who are unable to see their family at Christmas. And, And I want to pray into each and every one of these needs as well as the needs in your life. But what would it look like even if we stood together in this? I love coming to church every single Sunday morning for this moment where we get to stand together as a family and declare God's goodness over the situations going on in our individual stories. So what I'd love for us to do this morning is as an act of faith and even as an act of surrendering these things to God, why don't we raise our hands together if you're comfortable? But why don't we raise our hands all over the room and just surrender some things to God. Let's pray together. God, thank you that you are in this moment. God, thank you that you are in this place. That no no matter how far it feels like you might be from us, you are there with us, God. No matter what we might be going through, no matter what the thoughts we might be even thinking in this moment are, God, you know them, you see them, and you're with us in them, God. 
God, I pray over every single person in this place who might be feeling alone or lost in this season. I'm praying for the people online who might even be feeling isolated in this season. God, we pray together today that you would just come close in this season, God. That even as we step into Christmas in the next couple of weeks, God, that your presence, Emmanuel, God with us, would be so tangible in spaces like this, God. So tangible in our everyday. So tangible as we go through what can seem like the hustle and bustle of life, God. We, I pray this morning that even in those moments we'd be able to stand together and stand and just take a step back and believe that you are there. See that you are there, God. God, we declare it this morning that you're with us in it, that every moment, every moment, every day, every single hour, God, you're there. So why don't we pray together, God? So why don't we praise together? Why don't we clear that together, church? You are faithful and you always will be. Every hour, every minute, you have always been there. You are faithful and you always will be. In every smile, every failure, you are loyal. Come on. How great is it to be in church today? Come on. Why don't you grab a seat, find somebody next to you, get to know them. But Matt, before you get off the stage, Matt, I have a question for you. This morning in the first service, I made a joke about that song, the, the Windows song, Open the Windows, all about how my, my window didn't open and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh -huh. But really the question I have for you, in singing that song today, uh -oh. is it an ode to the online church? Yes, it is, because they have windows. No, they, op they woke up this morning, they opened up the window to let the light in. No, I thought they opened up their Windows PC to let the light well, in. Well, do no. you know, oh, oh, no, God. That's, that's what I was going for. I guess he just there communicates jokes better. I don't know, but <laughs> hey, it's so great to be in church today. All of you online, thank you for opening up that window to let this light in, and for those of you who are in the room, Thank you for being that light for them to open up the window too. But hey, it's so good to be in church together. I love being here every single Sunday. But, but hey, if you're new with us, we'd love to welcome you into the family. There's a couple different ways we do that. And you can find out more about them at our Next Steps booth, our welcome home banner just at the back of the auditorium after service. But we've got connect groups throughout the week, which are just small gatherings, like family gatherings, where we can come together and get to know each other. For those of you online as well, we have online connect groups as well. So even if you are eight, nine hours away, like I know some of you are, you can be part of an incredible incredible community even from a distance on a Zoom call or a Google Hang or whatever that is. And uh, the other thing is that we have the midweek. Midweek is where our team comes together to be inspired around where we're going as a church, to come and be inspired around the culture and, and what it is God's doing through here in the life of church. And then we put it all together and we actually step out and uh, we build church together. So everything here that you see is actually set up in the midweek to, to prepare a place for you to come in. And, and if you've ever, ever, ever experienced any good from being here, we'd love to open up the doors to other people to experience the same thing as well. To, 
open up the windows and let the light in. Thank you, Pastor Caleb. But speaking of Pastor Caleb, we have Pastor Caleb bringing the word today in just a few minutes. But before we get to that, why don't you guys put your hands together to welcome up Pastor Colin with a word around our giving this morning. Awesome. How's everybody doing? Doing good? Well, hey, look, this morning at the 10 a.m., because how many people think Derry and Alan here, both jumping in, Derry second week, Alan's first week. Oh, come on, we can do better than that. They're killing it. So last week, last week I tried to put Derry in a position to do a drum solo because this guy can also play drums. So we tried this morning and it didn't come together. So this is what I thought is during this giving message, could we do this arrangement just in like a reggae style arrangement? Is that, is that possible? It. Is it possible That's that cool. we could do that? That's better. Yeah. That's nice, yeah, okay. I feel like, um, what's that song? It's like, girl, you're my angel. Yeah. You're my probably culturally offended somebody. It's okay. My wife's half Jamaican, if that means anything. But what, what, I wanted to, what I want to do is just share. Oh boy. Where do I go from here? I just want to share around generosity. It's a uh, great segue. Great segue, right? Hard as a car crash. Um, but no, I want to speak around generosity and, um, and just first and foremost say a huge thank you online too we love you guys and just a huge thank you to everybody who's already been giving uh online text to give there's going to be some ways on the screen they're already there uh, that you can take advantage of but pastor helen last week she shared an incredible incredible word and i love one of the questions that she asked she asked this question what are we going to do with that one wild and precious life that we have and i think that is like such an incredible question and it's such a leveler of the best life that we can live. Because I think ultimately, for so many of us, if we were to answer that question, or if our culture was to answer that question, what we'd really define it as is, well, the one thing that we should do is get something, right? At the end of our days, maybe get more material, get more stuff, get more notoriety. And yet when you look at the life of Jesus, it was the exact opposite of that, is that Jesus actually came into the world giving. Right, and, and this is the beautiful thing about Jesus, is that he didn't come into the world to take something from us, but he came into the world to bring and give his grace and his mercy and his peace. And that's what motivates us and orients us towards giving. And, and so again, I wanna thank everybody who's already given, but I also wanna encourage you, especially if you call this house home, is to play your part financially in the house. See, when we give, it creates a space for somebody else. And it's actually because 10 years of faithful giving, people who've given in and out of season, because of that revelation, that it's better to live giving than it is to receive. And it even says in Acts 20. But there's been so many people who've done that. And, and I just really believe, especially if we call this house home, it's the greatest thing that we can do is start to partner financially as well. And maybe for you today, that's gonna to be a huge faith step. And maybe for you, it's just gonna be taking a step to say, I'm gonna do something consistently. That's why I love text to give because it's a way that you can actually just consistently just schedule in your giving, maybe recurring, monthly, bi-weekly, whatever your kind of rhythm is financially in your life. But it's actually to embed it into your life and make it a priority. And, and I just think maybe today, what we could endeavor to do is say, let's each and every one of us play our part. I don't know what that looks like for you, but let's all step out in faith and play our part today, believing that God is gonna do something in and through this house. And so again, thank you to everybody online as well. If you guys wanna give, you can go to mychurchcanada.com or use text to give. Um, but what we're gonna do is have the team come up. They're gonna uh, collect the offering and kind of go around. So there's envelopes under your seats or maybe they're on your seat. You can drop that into the bucket or on your way out. Uh, but I'm gonna pray, God, I thank you for today. Thank you for 
just a sense of your presence in worship, God. And we're expecting for the word today. I pray that you would bless everybody here and everybody online. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Hey, check out the screen for church news. Today after service, we have Growth Track. Growth Track is a series of short meetings right after service designed to help you get to know the heart and soul of who we are as a church. Whether you're new to church or you've been coming for a while, Growth Track is the best place to get to know a little bit more about who we are, what we believe, and so much more. You'll get to meet some of the amazing team that make church happen and get personalized next steps for your journey. Join us after service in the Welcome Lounge for Growth Track. week, okay? I want you guys to mark that in your calendars. We are going to be kicking off the Christmas season. I got to know, quick poll, are, are, is it appropriate to set up for Christmas before or after December? Yes. Seeing some before, okay. All right, well then you're going to like next week. We're going to be really launching in and creating a Christmas environment. We got a whole bunch of little things that are going to be happening. So I really want to encourage you, bring your friends, your family next week and every week until Christmas or every weekend, we're going to be doing a whole bunch of different things. Santa may make an appearance, uh, a whole bunch of other things happening. And so, and, and CK is also going to be dressing up in an elf costume as well. And so it's going to be, I know he's excited about it. I'm excited about it. Uh, but hey, how many people are looking forward to the word today? We have the opportunity to lean into the word of God. And I really want to encourage you. I really believe every time our pastors share there's this ability for God to speak to our situation, not in a general way, but in a specific way. So in honor of God's word, can we stand up to our feet? Welcome up Pastor Caleb as he gives the word today. All right. Grab a seat. Thanks, guys. Give someone next to you a high five. Turn them to, there's no one else I'd rather be sitting next to than you if you're sitting next to someone. Y'all guys ready for the word today? I don't want to waste any more time um, setting up anything because I just want to get into it because I got a, a bunch of things I want to try to get across to you guys this morning um, or this afternoon, I guess, would be better well said. So welcome to church, everybody. I'm glad that you're here. Um, at 12 p.m., it's, it's, we're nice and cozy here today. Everybody online, big shout-outs to you guys as well. Listen, I want to give you a little bit of a different, you know, kind of message today. It's kind of a message that I'd like to platform because... We're trying to really build our team up in this season, and I want to give you guys a glimpse into what our Wednesday nights look like. So I thought I'd bring a message that kind of reflects the nature of the message we bring on our Wednesday nights. Wednesdays is our team night, or otherwise known as midweek. And uh, it's a midweek injection of faith, wisdom, you know, whatever you need, life leadership. We design messages and tailor things together there so we can equip you to go live the life that God's called you to, to live. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean that on Sundays we're not doing that. Obviously, on Sundays we're bringing inspirational messages, faith-based messages, faith, hope, love kind of thing. Everything's centered around those three things and hoping that you're feeling a little bit like you got a, a bit more spring in your step, that you can continue to do it because God knows that out there, life happens to all of us, okay? And so in here, it's going to be a house of encouragement and a house of hope, a house where hopefully we're helping you and living the, the dreams across your life. But I want to give you um, a bunch of things here today to consider because I've, I've been in ministry now. My wife and I have been in ministry for the better part of men about, well, I, I started in ministry actually like pastoring in 2003, I believe. I was. So what, what year is it now? 2021. So I'm just shy of 20 years in ministry. Man, I should get an award, okay? 20 years in ministry. For those of you who know, most people, they don't last five years in this line of work. So, hey, but uh, that's not to discourage anybody from taking that line of route. I just encourage you, but it's just, there are keys to longevity and what have you. I want to give you today some wisdom learned along the way. So it's kind of like our Wednesday night wisdom. It's going to be a weekend wisdom bit here today. And I want to cause you to consider some of the things. We're all expecting something from God in our lives. What is it that you can expect as you begin to outwork what you're expecting from God? 
I like to say, you know, what to expect when you're expecting big things from God. Well, I would love to give you a very honest kind of, uh, you know, groundwork for what to expect as you begin to really outwork the dreams and purposes across your life. I think that everybody starts out a little green. Everybody starts out, and whatever it is that God puts in their heart, a dream, an aspiration, you know, call, whatever it is, we all set out with big dreams and aspirations. I think that, though, it's, it's important that you also have a very realistic expectation of what to kind of expect as you begin to endeavor into those things. Life is going to happen to you. And I think that sometimes we can read the Bible with rose-colored eyeglasses. And that's not to say that we don't get inspired around the good things. I want you to be inspired around all the positive things that the Word of God is, is living. But sometimes I think that we can gloss over the very real realities that those people were navigating. And when we find ourselves feeling the feelings that they felt, experiencing the things that they experienced, we go, man, this shouldn't be right. And I really want to equip you today so that I can better make sure that most of us, we realize the dreams that God has put across our lives, that we see them come to fruition, and that we walk in them knowing full well we were equipped, right? Equipped. And that's really what church is. So those are online, those of you here today, we're equipping you for the works of ministry. That's Ephesians 4, verse 11 and 12. That God, you know, he points some to be certain roles, whether it's, you know, prophet, evangelist, teacher, pastor, whatever it is. In evangelist, those are all roles designed to equip you as the church to go out and actually know what to do out there. So I know some, some of us like to come and go, okay, you do the work. Well, I'm actually not the one who's in full-time ministry. Y'all are, okay? And I know it's really weird to think. I know that's a weird thing to say. But really, uh, my job is just to help you go and do the stuff that I get paid to watch you do, okay? And I know you're like, well, what, what do we even like, you know, that's, you do the work, you know? It's like, no, you do the work. You know, this is the big back and forth that we have in church life. So um, I want to equip you. And, and I think that w the way to do that is maybe pull from some of the lessons that Jules and I have learned over the years. Obviously, I'm going to be pulling from my own experience and from my own perspectives. So that's not to, you know, color it in any kind of, you know, personal way. But all I can do is speak from my own journey, yeah. right? And, um, and so today I'm hoping that I can bless somebody, encourage somebody on their journey, and some of the things that, whether you're facing them now or yet to face them, maybe you could take some of the wisdom, put it on the shelf, and go, okay, for a rainy day, you know? Yeah. I'm going to need that one day, but that's my goal. Does that sound good? Yeah. All right. Everyone bow your heads, stretch your hands out toward me, and say, Jesus, help that guy up there. <laughs> okay, amen. All right, thanks. I appreciate that. Hey, you know what? If I could give you some wisdom here this morning on what it is that you're going to expect as you begin to expect something from God to do outwork a big dream across your life. I want you to understand this. Number one, it's going to be a whole lot harder than you think it is. Yeah. I said it's going to be harder than you think it is, but, and here's, I like big buts and I cannot lie, okay? <laughs> but it will also be a lot more rewarding than you think it will be. Yeah. You know, I, I speak from ministry and, man, it is so rewarding. You know what? People go, it's so hard. And, uh, you know, while I can, like, resonate with some of the things that people go, it's so hard about, I, I definitely don't pity them and partner with them and my pity partners, you know? Because I'm like, yeah, it's hard, but gosh, it's so worth it. And, and the truth is, is I think that, you know, what I've learned about life, if, if, if whatever it is that you're setting your heart towards, whatever it is you're putting your hand in and, you know, setting your hand, you know, what's that saying? Hand to, thank you. If it's not worth giving your life for, it's not worth giving your life to. Wow. Yeah. It's going to be hard. And if you want to experience something that you feel like, man, that feels good, how rewarding. Rewarding doesn't come unless it costs you something. Wow. If it was easy, then everybody would be doing it. Yeah. And so I just want to encourage somebody here today to understand, number one, it's life is going to, the journey of life, the, the outworking of the aspiration of the dream that God's put in your heart, yeah. it's going to be hard, but it will be worth it, and it will also be rewarding. And um, I've learned that life, it's kind of a paradoxical. My journey with God, your journey with God is going to be paradoxical. It's going to be the best of times and the worst of times. And guess what? All at the same time. Something weird that I was like, man, is this supposed to feel different? When I'd come into a certain milestone. I was like, well... I saw this going differently in my mind when I, when, I, when, I, when I got to that threshold, when I finally broke through that barrier, when I finally broke that growth curve or whatever it is, you know? I thought I would feel different. And, it's, and I realized because the reason I didn't like fully like give myself to it is because I recognized that while I was being blessed, I was also battling on this side of my life. I was being blessed in this area and battling in this. 
I was experiencing a public victory and success in the eyes of people, but I was experiencing a private failure or an issue with one of my kids or whatever it is. Have you ever noticed how life is paradoxical like that? It's like, man, I thought like I should be winning and so it should be all winning, you know? All I do is win, 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 you know, they do these things. I'm like, no, you don't. You, are my, you may be crushing it over here, but I guarantee you, you're crashing it over here. Because life, it's got many facets and faces. And there is nobody out there, they're lying onto you on Instagram, okay? If they tell you that they're just presenting winning all the time. They are not winning all the time. And while they may like to post that because that's what makes them feel better, okay? I came here to give you an honest depiction of what life is, and social media isn't that. It is a true honest depiction of realizing that sometimes you've got to learn how to, like Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a great depiction. In chapter 4, he was entrusted with the work of reestablishing the city walls of Jerusalem so they could have security, safety, kind of build their, you know, their lives back up again. But it says that there was very real threats coming at them as God gave them the city. And so he commanded the people, take a trowel in one hand and start mortaring the bricks and start building that wall back up, but hold a sword in the other. There it is. You're both building and battling intention together. You got in your one hand a sword and the other hand a trowel. For those of you who don't know what a trowel is, the thing you use, scoop up the mortar with and you watch YouTube DIY videos and you, like me, you're amazed at the sand. You know those like, you know those d drywallers out there? That just, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. I'm like, man, look at that fanning job he just did. I'm sorry, I'm speaking from my own experience, but gosh, it's satisfying. Go watch a drywaller in a profession and tell me that's not freaking awesome. Okay? It's these guys are awesome. Anyways, if you're in the trades, what's up? Love you. Um, you know, come help me with my, my basement. Okay. Um, but life is, is going to be a tension. It's going to be a juggle. And, it's, and I often say to people, the struggle is in the juggle of life, where you're battling on one side, but building on the other. And that's why in this season, we've got to learn that, yes, we've been battling, and we've been fighting to put food on the table. We've been fighting this invisible enemy called corona. We've been fighting, you know, to keep our jobs. We've been fighting to stay sane and maybe even to stay sanitized. You're fighting people left-leaning and right-leaning politics. You're fighting, you're battling. But here's the thing. Don't, rem don't forget, you got to keep building. It's time to build and to battle. They go together. Life is paradoxical. Can I give you another example? <laughs> David in the Bible was somebody who, who experienced this. He was winning in one side, in the public arena of his life, but failing in the, in the private area of his life. And now I'm not speaking about his adulterous moment. I'm actually talking about when he was going out and raiding and God was with him. He had anointed him to be king and he was showing everybody that he had what it took to be the king. But yet he was anointed, but not yet appointed. But he was dominating. He was out at war. He comes home to his city where he was staying for a time for 16 months. Okay, he was in this place called Ziklag. Well, as they were returning home with he and his men with the plunders and the spoils of war, it says that they saw on the horizon the village going up in smoke and billows of smoke coming up out of it. They're like, oh my gosh, what? Normally they'd hear the sound of the women coming out with the, the tambourines and the clanking of the pans and celebrate their men coming home. You know, the kids would be out cheering, yay, dad's home and yay, my man home and whatever and they heard nothing so they ran to the city gates to realize that a a surrounding you know uh tribe and, and raiding group came through and and pillaged the place took all their spoils took took all their wives and children and in that one moment they experienced devastation even david's own men it was a low point of of leading where the people who loved you and served with you want to stone you and they, they turn their backs on you and they want to, they don't, because here's the thing I've learned about leadership, learned about life. Sometimes people are going to use you as a punching bag, but you have to understand that you're not the source of their anger. Yeah. You're not the source. The, the issue is not really the issue. They're not really mad at you. Maybe they're projecting their, their mother wound onto you, or maybe they're projecting their daddy issues onto you, or maybe they're projecting just their own sheer disappointment of why they're not where they want to be and you are kind of thing in life. All I'm trying to say is you're not always the source of it, and that's something to definitely take note of. But David, he was experiencing in the public arena success on his Instagram. He looked so amazing, but he came home to his private life and realized that it was being pillaged. Wow. When I ever known, like, man, I'm killing over here, but my kids are out of control, or I'm killing over here, but my wife and I are growing more and more distant. Yeah. I think that's the nature of life. It's paradoxical, and we've got to make sure that the success that we're going after in life is actually good success. The kind of success that God wants to give you. I think that sometimes we can run ahead and, and get successful, but 
At what cost? It's not, it's the kind of, it's the kind of success that you get by, you know, maybe as a business person, you kind of, you were kind of a little bit, you know, you wouldn't say you're dodgy, you're just saying business is business. It's like, that's how you justify your lack of integrity, you know what I'm saying? You know, and so what you do is you come into success, but really you don't sleep well at night because you know, man, that guy, I cheated him out of a deal or I, I took advantage of those people or, or man, you can't sleep at night because you're not experiencing the good success that causes you to sound, sleep soundly at night. You're causing the success, you've come into success that causes you to look over your shoulder at night. Yeah. Better sleep with one eye open type deal. And that's not the kind of success. Hey, can I just say it? That's not the kind of success that God has for us. The Bible tells us that God said to Joshua, I want to give you good success only implying that there's such a thing as bad success. Yeah. I think that good success means you come into fruitfulness and fortune. You come into, you know, the kind of success that you dream of that your family's still intact. You still love your spouse. You know, your kids are loving life. And, you know, success where you're, you're winning in life, not where this paradoxical type where it's, it's crashing over there. But nevertheless, life is going to be a tension where we have to understand that Serving God doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Serving God doesn't mean that life isn't going to be hard. Can I set this out in my first point? Just off the side. Can I say that today? Hey, serving God sometimes, I think that we have this notion that if I'm in the will of God and I'm serving God, it ought to come with a level of ease. It ought to be met at, with the absence of problems or conflict. But I've learned in serving God that, man, why do people hate me? Or why do people are so upset? Or, Man, I thought this was going to go, like, all I'm trying to do is a good thing. And this is the thing I think that many of us need to settle as we begin to do a life in serving God and working at the dream. That though just, you're trying to do a good thing, that doesn't mean that everyone's going to recognize you for doing that good thing. Yeah. And such is life. Such is life. I wonder, do you have what it takes to keep going despite the fact that people may not understand you, despite the fact that it gets hard? Yeah. Don't let conflict confuse your calling. Don't let the presence of conflict confuse you and cause you to question, God, did I do something wrong? Did I miss it? I must be doing, no, 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 sometimes it's not, the de it's not the devil that you need to like, you know, wonder about or even the decisions that you made that you wonder like, man, maybe I made a bad decision or maybe it's the devil. We always like to blame the devil at forsaking our own decisions in life, but is it a decision is the devil, but could it just be the fact that you have a destiny to calling across your life? You know what, going back to David just for a moment, this says that the raiding armies took and abducted, they, they, they basically took them as their, their, their wives and their children. Do you know that wives and children actually represent something in the Word of God? The Bible says that he who finds a wife finds favor with the Lord. Oh, so if you look at the Old Testament kind of symbolic meaning that things represent, David's favor was attacked by the enemy. The enemy attacked his favor across his life and tried to steal, rob, kill, and destroy his favor. Okay, what do kids represent? Children are an inheritance from the Lord, the Bible tells us. So the other thing the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy is the inheritance. The things that God has stored up for you, that you were designed and destined to walk into because of everything he's called you to. My question to you is, are you just going to let the enemy walk into your life and convince you that it's hard to throw in the towel, to throw in, the, in a season like this, and things get difficult and discouraging, and so you think, man, God can't be in it. Well, wait, wait, wait. I'd ask you to ask Joseph that. God can't be in it, who spent 13 years, I think, better part of... 13 years in a prison, favored by God, favored. Remember, he, the only reason he got sold to slavery is because he was wearing the favored jacket of his father. The enemy hates your favor, see? Or what about, you know, Paul, who here apparel, there apparel, everywhere apparel, apparel in Paul's life. And he starts talking about the marks of it being an apostle. He talks about being shipwrecked, left out to sea naked. He talks about people raiding him and bandits pursuing him, people throwing rocks at him. I mean, it was crazy in Paul's life. It was hard, but that didn't mean that God wasn't in it. What about Jesus? Jesus hung on a cross, yet was in the direct center of God's will. I often think that we think if it's God, it shouldn't be hard. But hey, it may be hard, but I promise you it's worth it. Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. Yeah. For the joy set before him. In other words, it was hard, but it was worth it because of the people that were on the other side. So yeah, the dream's going to be hard but it's going to be worth it. And it'll be far more rewarding than I could ever explain to you in words. The feeling of victory, the feeling of life change, the feeling that you fulfilled what God had called you to do, there is nothing like it. I want to encourage you, don't you give up or, or don't you throw in the towel. No, you pick up the trowel in Jesus' name, okay? And you pick up that sword and you realize that life is a tension. Sword, building and battling in Jesus' name. Number two, your character 
in life is going to be tested more than your competency will be unless you're a brain surgeon, okay? Um, I'm speaking from my line of work, obviously, in this one, but your competency, your character will be tested more than your competency will be. I've learned something, that when it comes to God and the calling across my life, he actually, he, he does not require his, my, like, he doesn't require your skill to do his will. He needs you to have character, though. I've learned something. The, the book of Proverbs tells us that your gift will bring you before kings. Whether it's a physical gift or whether it's like a talent gift. I've learned that gifted people are brought before influential people. Just look at the president and, and the artists that come through the door, you know, for their dinners, you know. Gifts bring you before kings. But what I've learned is if you want to keep the door open, your character keeps you there. And sometimes we need to recognize that it's not just all about your talent. Talent is a, a major part of it. Giftedness is a major part of it. But let's never understand and divorce gift from character. Your character is the foundation that your gift will be held and stand upon. And therefore, if you lack character, think about it. In my line, in my industry, churches or, you know, world, like politics. What do you see? It's one of the things that often, you know, discredit or, you know, sideline somebody. It's a character issue. Drugs, sex, rock and roll, no. Uh, but, you know, money. You know, I always tell people to watch out for the 3G network. It's the gold, the girls, or, or the guys, or the glory. You know, those three things are life's, you know, tripping stones. Gold, like money. I'm just so, I'm pierced with the love, with the grief of the love of money. Love of money, by the way, uh, like making money is not a sin. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. And therefore, I'm all about, you make wealth, you go. You go, girl, okay, you get it, all right? Everyone online, make some cash, all right? We serve a God who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. It ain't money, that's a problem. But our love of it, our pursuit of it at the cost of everything is what pierces us with griefs. Gold, it's, man, relational, like, man, you know, David's longing eyes got him in a little bit of trouble. How many of you guys remember that? I just thank God that he factored in his stupidity before he called him, you know? And so, aren't you grateful that God factored in all your stupid moves before he called you too? Y'all don't look at me polishing your halos. Come on, say amen with me. Y'all know I'm right. And so your character is going to be tested more than your competency will be. Your gift can carry you places, however, that your character cannot keep you. Your character can destroy the places uh, your gift took you. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. Yep. And you know what? You don't have to be an immoral person to lack character. You think, oh, well, I'm not cheating on my wife, or I'm not embezzling money, you know? I'm not, you know, like, you know, like, you're like, I'm pretty good. It's like, but I've seen anointed people that lie. I've seen anointed people that, you know, are really hard to get along with because of their ego. <laughs> it's like the platform became a nursery for their ego. It's like, wait, look out, guys. Somebody's coming in. Make sure you pop their head, though. Get the, get the sliding doors, you know, because I don't know if they're going to fit through the normal one, you know. Because we think, man, I'm the man. What's up? You know, like, all I do is win, win. And I'm having fun with that. But I've seen more talented and gifted people, as I'm sure you have as well, even in this season, who have come and gone because of a character issue. And my prayer for us is that we'd understand that character will be tested more than your competency be. So how, or competency will be. How is our character often tested? Can I give you like some real talk for us, just for like a quick second, about the areas that your confidence, or your, sorry, your, your character will be, will be tested in. As I read through the word of God and I look at Jesus and the things that he underwent, I was like, man, that was probably a testing moment. Could you imagine being the son of God here in the flesh, and people taunting you and teasing you, like, come on, take yourself off that cross. Prove it. You know, like, it would have been like, oh, like, you know, like, thank God he did not consider being God, like, the status of God, equality that, with God as something to be toted, but took on the nature of, you know, sinful humanity, took on flesh, man. You know, Jesus, is, you're going to be betrayed by people that you once trusted. Come on, everyone's going to experience a Judas. Right? And I've often learned, just like Jesus learned, your greatest betrayals, your greatest attacks aren't going to come from the outside. They're going to come from the inside. And there's nothing you can do about it. As a matter of fact, I've learned that betrayal is often a road that God uses to, to promote you. It's really weird. I know. You're looking at me going, huh? 
paradoxical. What's up with the kingdom, right? <laughs> you tried to take me out. It ended up taking me in. I don't understand how, but it, it did. You know, it's just weird. Bad press is good press, as they say. I don't know. But think about it. Jesus was betrayed, got him crucified, but that's the very thing that got him exalted. Jesus was crushed. Here's the paradox. He was crushed on the cross, but then equally at the same place. Remember, here's the paradox. Crowned. Isn't that weird? See? It's all at the same time. Yeah. Best of times. You're crowned. I'm the king. You know, like, yeah, he's being recognized as the king, just not in the way that he probably saw that going. Right. And equally crushed. Wow. This is the paradox. Can you live in that paradox to realize that sometimes, and this is equally for us who are a little immature, recognizing that sometimes controversy surrounds certain things in yourself and leaders. Can we just be these people? Never, never criticize someone in crisis. I don't want to be that guy. Pray that you don't, this is just a tidbit. This is free, okay? I don't want to be the guy who criticizes you in your crisis. Yeah. How come? Because Job's friends thought they saw why he was getting, you know, everything taken from him, why all this stuff was happening in his life. Yeah. And who, did, got, who got rebuked, Job or his friends? His friends. Wow. And you want to know why? Because he says, you, he says to them, I think it's in Job chapter 5, just, just his memory, so forgive me if I'm wrong online. Don't do that. Don't, don't fact check me, okay? But... But here's the thing. He goes, you think that I'm suffering all these things because I've somehow sinned and you think it's like my day of humiliation, but it's God who's humiliating me and cast a net from my feet. In other words, you think it's a sign of my guilt, all the things that I'm enduring, but it's not. Even, remember Paul? He's a prisoner for serving the Lord, experienced a shipwreck. As, I mean, he probably thought he was going to go and testify before Caesar, you know, in Rome. He's always wanted to go to Rome. We know this as much. Paul tells us that. He's always wanted to go and go to Rome. He's always wanted to testify. And he knows that he's going to testify before Caesar. But how did he get given, bring, brought there? Well, he probably thought, I'm going to go across. It'll be a Mediterranean cruise. I'll be on the Caribbean Disney princess cruises, you know. I'll be on a wine tasting, cheese tasting tour. And I'll arrive all rested up, ready to serve Jesus. How does he go? They arrest him on false charges. They set him in prison for the better part of two and a half years in Caesarea. Remember the heck? Tell him we were there, sitting in the place where he was imprisoned, like on the foundations of the prison. It was crazy. It was crazy. I have to say, though, his view was really nice, though. But <laughs> I'm sorry, Paul. You probably are like, dude, what? Um, it's bad. But I'm just saying the Mediterranean is it's beautiful. And it's just all about perspective, Colin. It's a perspective. Do you see the bars or do you see the stars, Colin? You know? But here's the deal. is He's brought as, as a prisoner. And then they go through a storm on account of the, the, the captain of the ship. Totally busts up. He has to swim to shore. Everyone's spared. He gets on his shore. God spares his life. He goes, it's cold. It's wet in this new island of foreigners that they didn't know called Malta. We now know that place. Malta is a cool place. Okay. Got lots of honeybees over there. And basically, I don't know why I know that. I just do. Um, oh, we'll take up another tithe at the end of service for that. But what happened was he gets there, and guess what happens? He's starting to make a fire just to warm up because no one likes being cold and wet. It's like the worst feeling. Like, oh, this is horrible. And he makes a fire, and a viper comes out of the heat of the fire and latches onto his hand. And what do all the locals do? Surely this guy's a murderer. Look at him. He was a prisoner that escaped the sentencing that he was due, not knowing the only reason he's there because he's serving God. Right? And what do they say to him? They said, God's giving, sending, sentencing the sentence of death. Wow. So they watched their watches. And they, they just watched and counted down the minutes until he should die. And then he just shook it off and kept serving the people. And, and next thing you know, he didn't die. And so what do they do? They quickly turn their, he's a God. This guy is clearly a God. Come pray for my dying dad. And so the chief brings him to his, Publius, his name, brings him to his daddy. And Paul, with the same hand he got bit with, lays his hand on the man who's sick and heals him. He's not going to preach to somebody. Because here's, I guess, what I'm trying to work out in a maybe a long-winded way. But it's just something to consider. They were sitting there criticizing him in his crisis. They were judging his journey, not knowing anything about him and why he was there. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever considered that maybe the next time you look at so-and-so and you go, and you look at your watch going, I give them three months before their marriage falls apart. I give them three months before that church just, you know, closes its doors. Or I give that business, you know, this. It's like... Maybe be their cheerleader and not their firing squad. Come on, somebody. Something to consider. You don't know the journey they've been on. And if I've learned anything through pastoring, we don't always tell you the full story because we're, we, we want to cover other people. 
who are involved, and we want to make sure that, hey, it doesn't matter that God knows, and that's all that matters. So let's be a people who, I love this, who are generous in our assumptions toward each other. Oh, that's good. Generous in our assumptions toward each other. But you'll be betrayed by people you trusted. You'll experience relational rifts where people won't want to make peace with you, no matter how hard you try. That's why I suppose the Bible says, live at peace with all men as much as is possible with you. Because sometimes it's not possible. You're going to do everything you can in your power, but at the end of the day, you just have to let them go and let God, right? And just determine within yourself that, hey, I find those things can be emotionally draining for anybody. But I would just simply encourage you this. At any rate, I encourage you that, that even when others don't forgive and won't forget, determine that you will. Because right, it's a right spirit for the right kind of fruit that you're aiming for. Hey, you'll be mistreated by people you've given your best to. You'll be wronged by the very people you've acted up rightly towards. You'll be misunderstood. People see things I've learned the way that they are, not the way that things are. I like to say it like this. People think, see things the way they are, not the way that they are. They see the way things that they are. And oftentimes we can project our mother wounds, our daddy issues, our, our life experiences over one another, not realizing that we're actually projecting it. And so I would just encourage you, to don't just shake it off. Observe it. Don't absorb that. Notice it, but move on. Don't take it on like something you need to wear. Hey, your heart motives will be criticized and misguided. By misguided, sorry. Your heart motives, your motives and intentions will be, will be criticized at times. And, and by misguided and wounded people who believe they are doing God and his people a great service by casting suspicion in, in, in over you and trying to discredit you. I mean, there's all kinds of things you're going to have happen across the life. If you've been around for any length of time, if you're, I don't know where you are in your journey, but just hear me, it'll happen. But I think that my advice is to understand, well, leadership is only 10% of what happens to you, 90% of how you choose to respond to it. So here's my advice. Worry about your character, not about your reputation. Like, this is huge, especially all you social media fans. Stop looking what they're saying about you, about what that, this, that, other. Worry about who, your character. Because one of your, your character is who you are. Your reputation is who they think you are. If you believe in Jesus here today, you trust that there is a God in heaven who knows you by name. Even David says, you know me. You know my innermost thoughts. Then God will know the purity of your heart. So stop trying to vindicate your, 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 your name before other people. Because oftentimes the thing that's driving you to vindicate you is because you're so undone by the fact, oh man, what if they think that about me? Or man, I don't want people to think this. And it destroys you. But really you have to understand the only thing that's being harnessed in that moment is your ego. Is your ego. Why do we care so much about what they think? Why do I care about how they see it? I mean, think about Jesus. Look at this guy. And they falsely accused him. They said all kinds of stuff. He was so blameless, nothing stuck, but they invented stuff. They had just to invent. And don't think the enemy won't go so low as to invent stuff about you. Because he knows if he can't destroy you, he'll try to destroy how other people see you. And why is that such a tactic? Well, think about it. How you are perceived is how you are received. So if the enemy knows, man, I can't stop this guy. I'm going to talk to people. If they can't control you, they'll try to control how others see you. Because if I perceive you like this, I can't receive you on the level. I will only perceive you on the level that I, I perceive you at. So I think you've done something shady or controversial. I'm going to have a hard time being led by you or fed by you. Does that make sense? Hey, just consider that. Like this, man, he who has ears, let him hear today. Because it's in the word. It's all there. And so my advice is worry about your character, not about your reputation. And trust God with your reputation. First Peter, I think it is, it says that Jesus entrusted himself to God. He did not avenge himself or defend himself, it says. Why? Because he entrusted himself to God who judges rightly. In other words, God, my reputation's in your hands. Because here's the idea. If you're worried about your reputation, you're going to be a prisoner to what other people think of you. And let me just assure you that if you care about what others think of you, you will always be their prisoner. My advice, do not be a hostage. Do not be held hostage to other people's opinions of you. Stop allowing other people to tell you who you are. Some people will act like they know you better than you know you. It's crazy. They never walked in your shoes or your experiences and what you've been through. Giving all your power to their perceptions and living your life through their eyes of everyone around you is one of the worst things you can do. Break free from the fear of men. It is a trap. And truthfully, it's only your ego again that is being harnessed in the moment. So let's 
So we're clear, their opinion of you will not stop God's calling in and over your life. I like to say it like this. They can't block God's blessings from flowing over you. They have no power to, to shut the door that God opened. No one can, like, what's that saying? We say, like, like no man shut what, the door. The, the, yeah, God, when God opens the door, it's a door that no man can shut. There you go. Thank you. But can I just say like this? I got a quote from Caroline Leaf. She's like a neuroscientist, Christian neuroscientist. She talks about the brain a lot and how it works. And she wrote something that I thought was so good that I think is very applicable to this. And I think it's a big in a social media age. Look at this. Just so we're, he says, sometimes you have to make peace with the fact that you're going to be the villain in someone else's story, even if though you were doing the right thing. And watch this. You don't get to tell them how to narrate their own experience. You simply cannot control how people view you or what their experience of you was or is. That's theirs to determine. You can only control what you think and how you respond. So come on, somebody. Don't wait. Uh, you can easily place your confidence and your calling in the hands of other people around you, waiting for them to notice or recognize and, and shed their endorsement. But the moment you do that is the moment you realize that you're going to be, in, you, you've trapped yourself. And now you're not going to rise up to the level that God's called you to do because every time you place your confidence in the calling across your life in the hands of other people, they're going to lowball you, I promise. People are not as generous as God is. And you know what I learned? That David, had he placed his confidence in his calling in the hands of his brothers, even the king, the idolized King Saul, the handsome man of God, you know, Man, he would, have, he would never have gone anywhere. He would not have def done anything great. We would not read about the, the exploits that David led and how he drove back the enemies of Israel. We wouldn't have read about it because he would have led and lived his life waiting for people to notice. Did you know that I've learned in life that what man sets aside is often what God sets apart? Man will often set aside those that God has set apart. You know David? He, was, he wasn't even invited to the ceremony where they're going to anoint the next king of Israel. Samuel was sent to anoint. What? Set aside. Wasn't even invited to the party. And some of you, you're trying to sit at tables because that's the table I'm supposed to sit at. Don't worry. If you're supposed to sit at a table, you might not be invited to that one. But don't worry. Jesus is a carpenter. He'll build you a brand new one. And you can make that table as long as he intended it to be, where it's not this exclusive in and out groups. He's going to make a long table where you can fit as many people as possible because everybody's got a seat at the table of the Lord. Come on, somebody. Oh, y'all didn't hear what I said. I'm preaching way more than y'all are listening. That's some good stuff. And so, yeah, don't wait for the endorsement of man to start outworking your calling. I've seen so many people that are still auditioning for the call across their life. You don't understand, when God called you, you're supposed to start living it out, not start trying out. Stop trying to prove yourself to those around. Do you notice me now? I spent the better half of my career going, do you notice me now? Am I arrived now? Am I good? Now can I start like ministries? Like, like I didn't start the day that we started the church. It was like, what? But you can spend your life burning the candle at both ends trying to get their attention. Because dad always saw the B and you wasn't in the A. And so you're just always going to spend your, or the coach didn't give you the, the validation you're looking for. And this is why it's so important that we learn like David. If we're going to defend and defeat giants, do you realize how he got there? What did he say when he faced Goliath? Everyone thought he was crazy. First off, Saul said, well, you can't fight him like you. You're just a youth. Exactly why you cannot place your confidence in your calling in the hands of kings and leaders and those what they say. You have to get it from God because here's what they're going to do. They're going to lowball you and say, you're just a youth. You can't do anything great. You need more experience. You can't do anything great. You don't have the education. You can't do anything great. Well, do you have a degree for that? I remember, I'll never forget, there was a guy drowning in a lake in a canoe. And I went out to go save the guy. And the lady goes, whoa, whoa, wait. Are you a certified lifeguard? I was like, I better go to school. Wait, I'll go. Hang on. Just keep your head above water. I'm, I just got to go get an education first before I guess I can save you. What are we talking about? You know? We ran out there and this guy was like capsized. He was like, ah. Anyways, was, that was a moment I kind of looked at him like, did you hear the words that are coming out of your mouth? Like you, you, like, you reconciled that already, right? I was like, okay, we'll just look past it. We didn't hear anything. But... But here's the thing, if, Jesus, if, if David had placed his confidence in the hands of, see, and then he gets placed all this armor, Saul puts all his armor on and says, go fight Goliath like that. You gotta, like the Trisha, that's the way you fight. You fight like we fight. You do how we do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many of you guys know, like, 
God's going to give you your own method strategy. How to live. you got to be you. I love this thing, like, do you, boo. I love that junk. Like, you do you, boo. All right? Be yourself. And so David gets in his arm and he goes, man, like, appreciate all this stuff, but it's just not me. I'm just going to grab my sling and my stones because God delivered me from the lion, the hands of the lion, the paw of the lion and the bear. Therefore, he'll give me this guy. Notice two things there. Be yourself. Don't have to wear other things. Don't have to do it like them. You got to be that all stuff. The other thing was, he recognized that his value, his confidence was validated in private. In the backfields of his father's farm is where he met with God and had little victories. And it's a series of little victories that give you the confidence with God to trust who he says you are and what he's called you to do. That when you face the big, the big giants that people perceive are big, they're going to come down just like the little ones did. How do you beat the giants? The same way you did the lion and the bear. Knowing this, that God validated David's value in private. Therefore, he didn't go into the arena of public life looking to get his value validated. How many people do you see pick up a mic, get at a platform of some kind, and because they haven't got that foundation of identity sorted yet, rather than use it to serve people and feed people, no, they need people. They act like vampires. And while they might be gifted in serving, if you don't give them what they need, they are an insecure mess imploding on the inside because they've not learned that they're validated. So they're not working and serving from acceptance and belonging in God. They're working for it. Come on, come on, notice me, notice me. How many childhood stars have you seen come up and go that never had someone tell them, you're loved, by the way, just for who you are? Notice when Jesus was validated by God. Just let's go there for a second. This is really good. When Jesus was validated by God, God out of the clouds said, this is my son whom I love and in whom I am well pleased. Come on, fathers. Come on, mothers. There's something to be said about that. Notice that in that moment, Jesus had just been baptized and he had not started or performed a single miracle yet. What does that mean? What am I saying? I'm saying that God validated him first in private. He told him, I love you and you are enough. So you don't need to burn the midnight oils trying to show me that, am I worth it? Am I worthy? No. Your worth is not by work. Your worth is not determined by your work. Your worth is determined by your birth. You are a son and a daughter of God. Jesus was affirmed, approved, and accepted in private and from there went out and started his ministry. Don't get that order screwed up. If you got a talented young person or a kid, you got them going coming up and you know there's something on them, you make sure that you make sure that they know who they are before they get it because they're going to get into that arena and they're going to come on, come on, tell me who I am. And they're going to be applauded and praised when they first get in the arena. But you know what's going to happen? Then they're going to get criticized. And if, they let the, if their immaturity was there and they didn't sort out their identity, and learn that I don't need you to tell me who I am. I already know who I am. If you don't, if you need, so then their praise of people is going to go to the head. Yeah. But when the criticism comes, it's going to go to the heart. Uh, and it's going to euchre them useless. They're going to fall apart and they're not going to know how to live. They're going to be an insecure mess. They might project a strong image, but guys, hear me. Character, not reputation. That's the longest point. I, I went, I give you a bunch of freebies in that. Here's the thing. Can I just say it like this? People can pre present a a, uh, a perfect image, but they can never fake their fruit. Be who you are and keep showing people who you are. They might not recognize it. They might appreciate who you are. That's okay. Move on. Jesus did. He was rejected by his hometown. That stings. The, the people that you love the most don't see who you are in God. They'd rather reinforce the negative sides of you. I know who you are. It's like, oh man. That's what they said about Jesus. Is this not the son, just the son of Mary, the son of the carpenter? That was a low blow. My point is this. Jesus says you will know them by their fruit. I want to say something else. He did not say you'll know them by their Instagram. by the, the image that they, no, you'll know them by their fruit. And my prayer today is that you'd work at the fruit of your life. 
saying, am I becoming who God's called me to be? Am I still in alignment with that? Because God knows you need to be, because that is going to be the very thing that helps you last. Hey, number three, um, I got to wrap up, I think, in a couple of seconds, right? Is it, what, what time is this service? I don't, I don't know. So I'm just going to go with it. But hear this. Your greatest ability won't be your capability. Again, giftedness. The world totes like, man, you're talented. Wow, she's so talented. You need to see my friend. She's so talented. Like talent and capability is like the thing that we should herald and, and reward and recognize. Yeah. Well, that's part of the equation. I've learned with the dream across your life, you know what I've learned is actually the people who are possessing the platforms and some people who are just dominating crushing life weren't the most talented when they first started out. They weren't the most capable. They were the most available. They were the most durable. They're just still here. You know what I've learned about life? <laughs> I hate to be the bearer of, you know, bad news here for somebody, but life is coming for you. I know, you're thinking, look at your neighbor like, oh my goodness. It's like, it's like when Steve Penny came, it's like, there's a trauma coming, and everyone's like, oh. And we recognize now that was COVID, but... We were all like a little creeped out, like, oh, geez, like, I feel like I should be watching my, over my back right now, looking over my shoulder, like, what's going on? Life's coming for you. And here's the thing. I think that we need to understand it. Are you going to have what it takes to stay the course? And you know, in this season, people are, they're calling it the great resignation. They're coming out in business articles. You read that? Anybody? The great resignation. People are resigning over roles, over the whole world, all over the place. And I, I was talking to the guys in our vision film, so a little bit of spoiler alert, but I believe that people are resigning for much more than their roles. It's a core issue under the hood of their lives that is actually reflective of what it is they're navigating in this season. People are tired. They're fatigued. And life happened to some people in this season. And when life happens, the question is, will you have the ability to remain those who endure to the end shall be saved. Like it's like a remaining thing. Just the ability to stand and to stay put. Well, some of you may have switched jobs in this season and resigned from a career choice. I see people resigning from relationships. Well, you don't agree with my politics, so we can't be friends. I'm thinking, why can't we be friends? Why can't we be friends? That's a song I want to sing over them, you know? Marriages that have found themselves on the ropes because foundations in crisis has a way of revealing not just character. It doesn't create it, but it reveals it. Hey, here's another thought for you. People are resigning from their responsibilities. One of the first things I saw people do is step back from any kind of volunteer roles that they had in this season. Be it in church, hockey clubs, charities and NGOs. What was happening? People are in survival mode. And here's what I've learned. When you're in survival mode and you're worn out, people look for a way out. And they burn out and back out of roles, relationships, and responsibilities as a coping mechanism to survive. My question to us and challenge us as a church is, are you going to resign, however, from the things that God has clearly called us to remain in? You can change it up around. Change up your house. Change your furniture. Rearrange some things maybe some relationships in your life, but just remember, are those relationships, divine partnerships that God's called you to, to partner with? Are those the people that God's called you to walk with and work with? I said walk with and work with. Um, just as a thought, make sure you don't resign from the very things that God's mandated as our mission. So durability, you know, I've learned that fruitfulness, man, longevity has a perspective. I can just go here for a moment. Like longevity. I see some people resign their faith and forfeit the future that God has for them because things get hard. And again, the presence of hard doesn't mean that God's not in it. It means that if it gets hard, sometimes it's the, if you break through that hardness, man, the reward, it's like someone giving birth. It gets hard before it gets easy. You know, the, the labor pains come one on top of each other and the closer they get on top of each other, the closer you are to giving birth. And sometimes it gets a whole lot more painful before it gets better. But then the reward, my wife, every time that child popped out on her chest, she would look at that. Sorry, that seems graphic. But um, 
But she would look at that little baby, and guess what? It was like the pain of childbirth just disappeared because of the reward that was now in front of her. Again, Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. We endure the labor pains for the joy of a child. And there is a joy. If I could give you another couple things to think about. When you start out in life, young people, older people probably already got this one down, but establish clear boundaries. Some people don't have any boundaries. You know, they rock up to your house and didn't even phone you, and I'm like, man, we're not living in the 80s anymore, bro. I'm not even going to open my door for you. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I'm kidding. But hear me. You know, how many of you guys know what I'm talking about? Like, dude, just text me now, man. We got the phone's on me all the time. But um, boundaries. They're really important because God set up the waters of the oceans to go to a certain point, the Bible says, and to stop boundaries. Because God knows if they kept going, they would drown everybody. You remember Noah's flood, right? Where the whole, yeah, that's it. So boundaries. They're a good thing. You know, God causes the sun to come up and to rise and to come, rise and to go down every single day, routine. And there's a, there's a, there's a parameter. God set parameters in place. There's some people who live by a philosophy, anything goes. And people who live with lack of boundaries, you know what they often live? In jail. I know it's extreme, but if you take the extreme, well, I just thought I could, your house is my house. And so I just came in and took it like my own. You lack boundaries. Like, I get it. We want freedom, but freedom is enjoyed within parameters. Yeah. Wow. That is so good. I love fire, but not an open fire in the middle of my living room. I like it within the confines and the parameters of a fireplace. Because open fire quickly turns to wildfire and people get burned. But I love Colin. I'm just, not me, okay? I'm going to impersonate someone, a young person. But, bro, I just love sex. I, did I go there? I said that in church. Sex. <laughs> All night. Sex. I just love sex. I think it ought to be enjoyed at any given time of the day. If I feel the urge and the surge, let's act. And God says, parameters. I gave you a marriage and the parameters and the boundaries of a marriage. And inside that marriage, I'll promise you, you'll experience the best sex you'll ever, you'll ever have. I know you think it's good sex because it's like a good moment. It's like, man, we had a good go. High fives, you know? <laughs> Guess what? But then you're like, but are they going to stay with me? They didn't commit to me. And the insecurity starts rattling and you're like, man, but are we going to build a life together? Yeah. What if I get pregnant? these things, uh, and there's all these things, and I get it, but here's the thing. There is God's best, this parameter. Life is enjoyed within parameters, and people that go to jail are often people who, who don't respect the parameters and the personal freedoms of your life. They want to over encourage and so when they lack the self-governance to govern their own lives and endure and create those parameters, other people govern them for them and put them in places where they will be controlled, and this is life. Have you got... Parameters. See, when I first started out in our ministry, when, we, when you started in yours, I'm sure that you, you think you're invincible. You get out there and you start rocking, making waves, and you think, yeah, let's go, and you work really, really hard. And as you should. I think everybody should do that. It's, it's, it's a very satisfying thing. But you also realize at given time that if you not take time for your wellness, yeah. will you have time? Because you're going to be forced to take time for your illness. And so that's my question. Do we have time? Are you taking time? Here's another point that I'll just say around boundaries kind of works in together. Rest is not for the weak, as you suppose. It's actually for the wise. Taking time to rest, taking a day off. God created the Sabbath day and declared it good. God is omnipotent, all-powerful. He was not tired. God does not tire, as we suppose. Like he's, come on, somebody. But yet he rested, and he set an order, a parameter for us to follow that we ought to rest. Here's the thing. When you're young, you kind of feel like, I don't need to rest. I don't have any kids. I don't have any family to go back to. I have nothing, whatever. So I'm good. Let's just keep working. But here's the thing, guys. As there comes a point where you got to realize the boundaries were there to help you to last the long haul. Boundaries are there to rejuvenate you. I love recreation. And even like people that go, I don't have time for recreational things. God, recreation, recreates you in recreation. Like when's the last time you, you, you had fun and you, you just... 
laughed. Some of us do that all the time. You could probably use a little push there, but others of us could use a, a little moment to laugh. Time boundaries, social media boundaries. I got off of socials. And just let me bring you into my own experience on that. That was for my own personal health because I couldn't observe it and not absorb it. I recognized something that after a while, I would scroll through and it feels like eating McDonald's. You know, you think it's a good idea. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. We, yeah, you eat McDonald's and you think it's a good idea until it's not a good idea. Because the feeling doesn't hit you until about 45, half hour later and you're like, oh. And it sits like a heavy hockey puck. And you run yourself to the bathroom and you, got, you guys know, the, you, the Holy Spirit cleanses you all, all in righteousness. You know? But here's what I'm trying to say. I had to learn. There, social media is like a thing that we throw our kids into today and we go them online with no parameters. No screening and like making sure that we're keeping them from seeing bad things. Like they need boundaries. Because they can be overexposed to something. They can be, you know, brought to this thing. And next thing you know, you're like, what just happened to my kid? And let me just say, I just think social media boundaries is necessary for people. Or relational boundaries. I used to have people say to us, hey, can you come back and do a wedding for us? And we're on holidays. And I had to say, like, listen, I hate to be the bearer of bad news and disappoint you. We do care about you, but I'm not saying bye to my family to come marry you or come back and do that preaching gig for you, whatever. I'm using it in my own experience, but you know what that looks like in your own life. And my point is, is that, hey, you got to set those boundaries up. Work boundaries. Same thing. Set boundaries with the wrong voices and influences in your life. Not everyone deserves access to you. A simple way to determine who gets the best of your life, ask yourself, who gets the best? With whom do I rest? The people that you lay back and set your feet up with and rest with, the people you rest with are the people that should get the best of you. Thanks, Jules. That was yours. Everyone's saying, that's me. She's making the latest. But that empowering boundary has allowed us to continue to show up to all that we've been entrusted to nurture, raise up, and love as a father, as a mother, in our personal house, and as a father of this house in the, in the, in the kingdom of God. Yeah. All right. Let me, I got a bunch more, but I think that's some stuff to think about here today. But here's the thing. My prayer for us, guys, is that you'd walk in the wisdom of God so that you'd know that, listen, life has all kinds of faces and facets. And my prayer for us as we continue forward into all that God has for us is that you would recognize this. Hey, I forget all the things I said, but that you'd realize that it's harder than you think it is. It's going to be much more rewarding than you think it is. Your character will be tested more than your competency will be. And just keep it clean and keep it, you know, going forward. Uh, don't be held hostage to other people's opinions of you. The greatest ability is going to be your durability, to keep staying and hunker down and just remain. You know, I'll just end on this, and we'll end there. Um, remember David? He experienced some real loss in his life, and he wanted to resign in, in the season of his life up to his chambers. But it says that God, a friend of his kicked down his door in his bedroom. He kind of, his room became a bit of an escape, right? It was an escape room. There you go. And um, that's the preacher inside of me. Um, but he resigned to his room because he, he had lost some real, he, he lost a son in a battle. He was grappling with the grief of that loss. He also lost some friends in a battle. And he thought, man, there comes a point where life hits you and you don't know if you got to take what it takes to keep going. If you have the inner resource to keep giving yourself to people. you got to take care of yourself. Like, oh my gosh. You feel like you're running on empty. You feel like, I, I feel so hit that I feel a little disoriented. I don't know how to show up for you when I'm like, I seriously need to show up for myself. But it was his friend. He says, no, listen, listen, listen. You need to get out of this chamber and get back in your chair. Don't resign. Return. And remain in your seat of authority. Your people, they can see that you're grieving. They can hear you from here, man. He was basically saying to him, he goes, but listen, there ain't going to be a single person left with you unless you get bent on there and, and you show face as a leader. This is the tension that some leaders, some people face is that you got to keep showing up on behalf of your kids even though you had something happen. Mouths still need to get fed. They still need to be homeschooled. And you, you can't just stay in bed all day and go, man, I just oh, and have a pity party. You know what I'm saying? you gotta, you got to keep turning up because there's a responsibility. There are people on the other side. It's like David, he got firsthand encounter with this. But look at he remained in his seat, far from perfect, Still hurting, I'm sure. Still, you know, reeling over some of the realities of his life. But here, learn how to remain in this season. Learn how to remain. Y'all are here, so good on you. 
Hey, online, learn how to remain. Y'all are still here, but remain in your God-given purpose and assignment and trust that this, that God's going to go before you. If you keep showing up, He's going to start showing off on your life, and He'll fight for you in Jesus' name. And watch how the longevity across your life, man, is going to open up something beautiful for you. So, yeah, a couple thoughts of wisdom here today. Let me pray for you, and we'll get you off to your day, but... Jesus, I thank you so much for each and every person that has gathered here today. I pray that God, the message here this morning would bless and encourage somebody who's expecting great things from you. God, I pray that as they begin to outwork the dreams and the aspirations across their life, that you set them up with wisdom. Father, you said in your word, by wisdom the house is built and by understanding it is established. God, I pray that the wisdom of God would build the house, the dreams and the things that they are putting their hands and their hearts toward. That God, you give them good success and that they go to sleep at night soundly. And that, God, you would take them from strength to strength in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, amen. amen and amen. Come on, can we put our hands together? There's some tons and tons of life wisdom. And just before, just before we leave our seats, I did want to extend an invitation today uh, for you to know Jesus. And maybe this is the first time you've been in church, first time in a long time, maybe first time online. Um, whatever it is, we just wanted to give a, a moment for you to have a moment between you and God to make your peace with him. And this is the beautiful thing about it. And, you know, Pastor Caleb was talking about this idea even is that in culture, I think sometimes there's this pressure that we have to bring the best of ourselves. Online, we have to bring the best of ourselves. With our relationships, we have to bring the best of ourselves. And I think sometimes it can almost feel like that with God. It's like, man, I, if God would only accept me if I can come and be perfect and have this curated image. And yet, that's so far from Christianity. It's so far from relationship with Jesus. Because ultimately, when it comes to knowing Jesus, it's just taking all of us, our good, but also our sin, the places where we've missed the mark, and it's bringing it to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I need you. That's the truth that every Christian has come to, is that sin might separate us from God, but the beautiful thing is, is that when we come to God with our sin, when we come with our past, when we come with everything that we have in our lives, he doesn't beat us down. He doesn't diminish us, but he actually comes and just says, welcome home. I love you. I've been waiting for you, and I died for you. And that's the crazy thing, is that Jesus didn't just kind of see you, but he involved himself in your story. That he died for all of the places where I've missed the mark, where you've missed the mark. And in that place, he offers us his love and his grace. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, because this is just a moment between you and God, what I'm going to ask you to do is in just a sec is just to raise your hand. If you're going, man, I want to be included in a prayer today. I want to pray that and make Jesus my Lord and Savior today. If you're going, man, that's me. I want to make him my Lord and Savior today. All I want you to do is just raise your hand. You can put it right back down. And that's just so I can see you. And we're all going to pray together as a family. That's awesome. And if there's anybody else who's saying, man, I want to make that decision today to know Jesus. Look, this is what we're going to do so nobody feels centered out is if you're comfortable with it, can you just repeat this prayer after me? We're going to pray this all together as a family. Jesus, thank you that you took my sin and gave me your grace, your unmerited kindness and goodness. I make you the Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Come on, can we put our hands together for every single person who made that decision? Online as well, if you made that decision, we're just so excited that she did. And um, if you are online, what I want to encourage you to do is, is firstly follow us on Instagram or Facebook. Uh, shoot our team a message, or you can go to mychurchcanada.com as well if you're not on socials. But shoot our team a message, and again, we'd love to be able to connect with you. Maybe mail you a Bible, or you can download the YouVersion app. If you're here, we want to put a Bible in your hands. So you can go to the Welcome Home banner. But better yet, uh, like we were talking about before, we have Growth Track happening right after this service. We'd love to serve you some lunch. Meet right over there at that Twinkle Light area. Um, and so again, if you do want to just kind of know a bit more about our story, but as well, and this isn't just for people who made the decision today, but just if you want to know more about our church, I really want to encourage you, hang out at Growth Track right after this service. Uh, but hey, we're going to close the service, so we'll see you guys back here 12 p.m. next week, next Sunday. We'll see you online, 12 p.m. Go in God's grace. God bless.